Hello and welcome to part two of how to take advantage of Windows Azure tables from PHP. I'm Rob Bagby, developer of Angels for Microsoft Corporation. In part one, I talked to you about what Azure Windows Azure table storage is, uh, how you can achieve massive scalability, kind of how the structure works, and, and, and the RESTful API. In this screencast, what I want to do is show you, uh, given everything we learned or know about that RESTful API, how we can apply some simple PHP libraries like curl and simple XML to actually call and, and, and take advantage of that API. At the end of this screencast, I'll illustrate to you or talk to you about how this process gets much easier in just a few short weeks. So everything you're going to see going forward here in the next uh, seven or eight minutes is going to be made much easier at the end of the month. So with that, let's just jump in and show you how to do it. What we've got here is a little PHP app I've, I've written, and this is right now a static a static page. This HTML is not dynamic at all. I've hard-coded in uh, two lines. Just remember the name Coho Savignon Blanc. What we want to do is I want to, uh, I want to show you how we can make this uh, dynamic by actually calling into Azure Table Storage, given everything we knew about that, uh, that RESTful API. So with that, let me just go ahead and just do a Control F here. And we'll see that I've, this is where I'm illustrating that that is just totally hard-coded uh, hard coded information into this uh, HTML. This little line of code right here is just all of that line information. And this is what we want to replace with some dynamic code where we're, we call into that RESTful API. So the way I want to work this thing is I want to have, I want to work with classes. So I've created this wine class. And this wine class has some, some simple abstractions of what I believe a wine to be. It's got a wine name, a URL to the, to the wine label, bottle price description, vintage, and wine ID. You can see I've also got these three additional properties I described that are required for Azure Table Storage, including the partition key, which is our unit of partition or tells us which data needs to stay on the same partition. The row key, which I don't think I described, is the unique ID by partition. So this is a dual key. And the timestamp, which is managed by Azure Table Storage, which we use for things like concurrency. So I've got this little object that I've, uh, that I've written. Next thing I want to show you is this little sample or this little helper class I wrote. Now this is where you're not going to have to write this yourself. This is what we'll take care of all of this and I'll discuss uh, what we're going to be doing at the very end of this screencast. But inside of this, I had to write this now because it, it, didn't, it doesn't exist yet. And I wanted to show you how this works. So the first thing I did in my little helper is I've got a little template that defines how uh, the URI is structured. And the URI to your table is going to always be the account name you've got prepended to .table.core.windows.net and then slash your table name. So inside of my little helper method, get response, you pass it the account name, the shared key, and the table name, and then some information for paging, a page size, partition key, and row key. The first thing I do is I call get URI, which all it does is take the account name and put it right there, and takes the table name and put it right there, okay? Next thing we do is I just go ahead and use that, uh, that partition information I've got to create a couple little query strings. Uh, parameters, so next partition key and next row key, and that's how we that's how we handle paging inside of Azure Table Storage. So now I've got the full URI to my resource. Next thing I want to do is create the message or the signature uh, for my authorization header and get the rest of the HTTP headers. So I go and get the, the GMT formatted date, and then I call this little helper method I wrote called get signature. Let me show you what get signature looks like. You pass in and to get signature the date, the account name, the table name, and the key. And then over here, what we do is we create a message to sign, which is the date, end of line character, slash account name, slash table name. And then all we do is we just sign it using SHA. Once we do that, we return this signed message, and then we just create a little string. Shared key, the light, space, your account name, colon, and then the signed message. And that is essentially going to be what's used to create the authorization header. And so we go back up here to our code. And you can see we just call get HTTP headers and we pass it that signed message and, and the GMT formatted date. And that'll give us the four HTTP headers that are required to uh, use for authorization and to tell us what, uh, what kind of data we're accepting. Next, we're just using the curl libraries to essentially issue our HTTP get. And the curl libraries are going to give us back our response body as well as some HTTP headers. This code right here, I'm just using to parse the HTTP headers. And out of those two HTTP headers, I'm grabbing the partition key and the next row key, which I'm going to be able to use for, uh, for my paging. Okay? And then I just return that response body. 
Okay? So I've got this wine context object, and the wine context object kind of brings those two libraries together, the wine and the table storage helper. First thing we do is we just call our get response. So I call get response, my little helper object you saw me uh, before, my little helper method, and I get that HTTP response back. I load that data into simple XML, and then I just parse it. I know it's Atom formatted data, so I've got these two namespaces, and I can just iterate over that response and create an array of these wine types. So now I've got my array of wine types, and I'm just going to return that, that array of wine types. So if we want to replace this data right here, this static HTML, all we need to do is underneath my form tag, I'm going to go ahead and include those two, uh, two of those helper libraries, my wine and my wine context, and my wine context actually adds in this helper object itself. It's got an include in there. And then I can just go ahead and replace this code. Let me just delete that with some code to actually call table storage. And what it's going to do is it's going to call in my Coho storage data get wine page, and it's going to return that array of wines. I can then iterate over those wines and then output my HTML, including things like inside of my image, I can set the source to my wine label URL, my short wine name inside of a strong, and my uh, description inside of a span. Pretty simple to do down here. I've got, uh, I'm pushing out the bottle price as well. Now it's interesting to note here that I've actually uh, hard coded the partition key, the next partition key, and the next row key for now. And I'll show you, we're going to go ahead and add in in just a second the actual paging logic, and I'll get rid of those uh, hard-coded values. But let me show you that right now, this still works. Um, we're going to see that we actually did call into Azure Table Storage and got this data. I can't really prove that very easily to you because it, uh, it looks just like the hard-coded approach. So let me just add in that uh, partition code, or excuse me, that paging logic that I had, and we'll just tie that in. This paging logic is pretty simple, and I don't want to go into too much detail on it. But essentially, all I'm doing is I'm storing an array which acts as a stack, and that's going to tell me what pages I've been to or my previous pages. Then I'm going to manage the next array or the previous button, uh, whether you click next or previous. And depending on what you click, excuse me, next or previous, depending on what you click, I'm going to either pull something off of that stack if I've clicked previous, or I'm going to add something to the stack if I've clicked next. Got a couple helper methods that tell me whether the previous and next should be, uh, should be uh, enabled or not. And this is where all of that, uh, all of that paging, the paging buttons are located. I'm going to delete that, and I'm going to add in some dynamic, uh, some dynamic HTML here, where I can do things like dynamically turn on and off the uh, the enabled Im uh, the the images, whether they're uh, enabled or disabled. The last thing I need to do is just a little house cleaning. I need to uh, replace my hidden input that I'm round tripping that. Uh, that little uh, array or, or stack of my previous items. I need to uh, I need to add that code in here to where we're actually just uh, taking that array and serializing it into this little hidden uh, hidden field. That's how I'm managing my state. Oops, I uh, I fired the weapon too quickly. I've got to go get rid of that hard coded code in here uh, that hard coded the uh, hard coded the partition key and the row key. Let me get rid of that, and let me uncomment this right here, which is essentially telling us. All right, I'm going to go grab that uh, next row. And let's run this up. And we can see that we are now able to page through our data, and everything works just fine. Now, I want to briefly mention that what I did, a lot of what I did was, uh, was, was a little bit uh, involved. And as of July 31st, we're releasing the first preview of the PHP libraries to Azure Table Storage, and we should greatly alleviate a lot of the work that you that, that you had to do. We should be able to very simply make calls in, be able to do uh, issue puts, uh, posts and deletes as well, to be able to fully manage uh, Azure Table Storage. So uh, I'll be doing another screencast on that, but I hope that this was of value to you. If you want this code, go to my blog, robbagby.com, and uh, look for the associated uh, blog post. Thank you very much.